One of the most destabilizing forces in our modern civilization is the sense of powerlessness and alienation we can't help but feeling when confronted with the enormous corporate and government bureaucracies and the incredibly complex technologies that rule so many aspects of our lives. It makes many of us here yearn for more sense of community and more local control over our destinies, but we most often lack the tools to truly challenge those immense forces. Well, our next speaker is all about empowering us with just those tools. She has co-founded and is executive director of what I think has become, in the four short years since its creation, the most impressive citizen science activism initiative on the planet. Shannon Dozmegan is young, not too much younger than me, but she, had, uh, but she already had many years of community organizing and research experience when the BP oil spill hit Louisiana, where she's based. And she comes from a long line of Acadianas, if, you, if you're familiar with that history. She worked with the anthropology and geography departments at Louisiana State University as a community researcher and ethnographer studying the social impacts of the BP spill and worked with the Louisiana Bucket Brigade conducting the first on-the-ground post-spill health and economic impact surveying. Outraged by the information blackout surrounding the spill, she and Jeff Warren and Stuart Long decided to use helium balloons, kites, and cheap digital cameras to loft their own community satellites over the spill and determine what was really going on. Soon, partnering with local nonprofits and collaborators from across the country, they trained over 100 volunteers to collect 100,000 aerial images, created their own open source platform to produce high resolution maps, and partnered with our good friend Rebecca Moore's Google Earth outreach program to make them globally accessible and were able to debunk the official narrative. The public lab was born. Its mission is to democratize science, develop and share inexpensive, accessible, do-it-yourself techniques, generate knowledge, and share data about community environmental health, and increase underserved communities' ability to identify, redress, and remediate the environmental malfeasance and demand accountability. The public lab has grown by leaps and bounds and has helped, and has helped create an extraordinary, highly creative, global collaborative network that researches open source hardware and software tools and methods provides online and offline training and education, and supports local campaigns and struggles. From the Louisiana Bayou, to Brooklyn's Gowanus Canal, to Uganda, to Peru, to the Middle East, Public Lab is evolving into an unparalleled, cutting-edge, global civic science activist network, one ideally adapted to current digital communications media, but rooted in a respect for the earth and the rights of all its people. Shannon has become an incredibly busy woman. She just comes up, she just joins us from a retreat at Esalen. She's an Ashoka Fellow, a senior fellow at this Environmental Leadership Program, and just uh, came on board at the Berkman Center, uh, at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society as a fellow. And she now serves on the councils or advisory boards of many worthy activist, health, and scientific nonprofits, and is traveling globally to guide the expansion of the remarkable phenomena that is the public lab. We are very grateful she was able to find time to be with us today. Please join me in welcoming citizen scientist and ex organizer extraordinaire, Shannon Dozmigan. Good morning, Bioneers. How's everybody doing on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning, last day of the, the gathering? All right, awesome. Okay. Um, so let me go back. So um, I was introduced pretty profusely, um, and so I'm going to try to to cut through some of this and give you a bit more explanation about my background. Um, but I uh, I'm working at the intersection of technology, of science, of the environment, of social justice. Um, and so I wanted to, to take this time um, to talk a bit about my work uh, with Public Lab, um, the models and the methods that we've built out and developed. Um, but then I, I think probably a lot of people in this room are also starting to think through how uh, technology and, and science in the public space are influencing and affecting the work that you're doing. Um, so I'd like to, to provide you with some suggestions and um, some considerations that I've learned over the last uh, several years as well. 
Um, so I'm uh, the executive director of Public Lab. Um, we are a global open source community um, that's supported by a nonprofit, which uh, provides the backbone and the skeleton for um, the, the infrastructure that we maintain. Um, we're 6,000 6, people um, that are interacting in online spaces and in our local communities um, with a combined interest in creating low-cost, do-it-yourself style tools um, for environmental pollution. So we're, we're particularly interested in um, issues uh, that are affecting the environment from a justice-based lens. Um, we come from a lot of different backgrounds. I myself am not a scientist. Um, I have a degree in anthropology, but I've been an organizer and an educator um, my entire career. Uh, we have people who are artists and designers. We have biologists, chemists, um, social scientists that are all working together uh, to, to create the space that we're interacting in. Um, so in my mid-20s, uh, this is where I found myself um, in what's called and, and sometimes labeled the chemical corridor of Louisiana. Uh, so I was working with fence line communities, um, the communities that are right up um, on the, the fence of many of the industrial facilities, the, the refining companies, the chemical corporations um, that sit on the Mississippi River. Um, and I was using what came to be uh, my first introduction to low-cost hardware, uh, a creation of an EPA SUMA canister. It looks like a five-gallon bucket with um, a basic Radio Shack vacuum that would allow people to take their own air samples um, if they saw a huge flare coming out of one of the, the stacks of the refineries. Uh, but in April 2010, uh, the BP oil disaster happened. Um, and it, Things were, I mean, basically thrown into a frenzy. Um, the Gulf Coast uh, had to, to mobilize um, to figure out the best way to respond to the spill. Um, and as was mentioned, uh, one of the initial things that I saw um, as a young person, as somebody um, in New Orleans and trying to access information about what we knew um, was unraveling you know, miles from us, um, was that there wasn't information coming from the spill, from the disaster, uh, because it was heavily corporate controlled. Um, it was uh, being run by BP with subcontractors and the support of different government agencies. So I worked on a lot of projects um, trying to figure out the best strategies around uh, integrating people with information during the disaster. Um, and one of the ones that I fell upon um, or actively engaged in uh, was launching large kites, nine foot kites and five and a half foot balloons tethered to a simple kite string um, with a camera that you might pull out of your junk drawer at home and flying them 2,000 feet or so above the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and in doing this, we gave people um, the power to become engaged and involved and also to create their own stories and narratives with the number of different pictures that they were able to capture, the maps that they were able to create of the places that were of local importance to them, um, whether because they were fishing grounds, uh, because there were oyster reefs in the area, um, or because it was a, a, a spill area that was encroaching um, on a community uh, that they lived in. Um, so then taking a step back after the spill, um, you say, why is there a fox and a chicken on the screen? Um, <laughs> people in the room might have heard the term, there's a fox in the hen house. Uh, and so this is really what we started to reflect on, um, that the, the hen house of policy is built with this amazing, gilded, beautiful door for the fox to come in um, when it comes to environmental monitoring. Um, so the, the BP disaster was not a one-off event that needed the support of these kind of tools and methods for community engagement. Um, we saw a much larger landscape um, where tools were being created at the price point for corporations, for research institutions, and for government, but not for um, the, the people that were being impacted uh, by the facilities that were potentially doing the polluting. We also um, engaged critically with the, the notion um, of how public participation in science um, is supposed to happen. Um, so when we, we took a look, what we found was that in, in typical scenarios um, in citizen science, 
Um, a scientist would say, I have a question, um, and I'd like for you, know, you the, the community members, you, the, the people um, that are closest to that area, to go out and provide data for me. Um, without a sense of uh, the scientists then having a responsibility to provide data back in a format that was reusable and able to help people advocate um, for actionable um, objectives that they might have. So this is something that we also um, thought through in how we formed um, Public Lab. So what our model ended up looking like is this infographic. Sorry for giving you an infographic. Um, where we encourage people to work along the entire research continuum. So from asking questions, um, so identifying what the problem or the issue in your community, your neighborhood might be, to looking at the landscape of tools that might be available to do monitoring. And if they aren't available, make them. Um, so building the hardware tools, creating the software analysis platforms, going out and doing the data collection, uh, processing, interpreting, analyzing data, and then working towards drawing conclusions um, that will help lead towards actionable goals. Um, and we do that all together. So my, my four orbs, uh, educator, scientist, web developer, community organizer, um, we, don't, we don't encourage people to just interact at the place um, that's the most comfortable uh, or the most familiar. Um, we really want people to, to have a sense of how uh, the entirety of the process works, um, because we think it makes for a much more powerful movement. Um, so I wanted to just brush on a couple of the projects um, that have come out of this model since the BP spill. Uh, so our aerial imaging kit um, is one that has been taken across the world and used in uh, hundreds of different scenarios. Um, we've been working in western Wisconsin on developing passive and optical sampling devices for particulate matter sensing around frac sand mining locations. Um, bringing together people in Chicago, so students, uh, civic technicians, environmental justice groups in the southeast of Chicago, to measure and monitor the coal piles um, that are sitting open um, on the waterways in Chicago. Creating um, water monitors that can tell uh, the turbidity, the salinity, measure depth, um, measure conductivity of water. Um, so if there's a, a leak coming from a mining site or from a site that's being fracked and it's going into water that might affect agriculture land, this is something that people can determine. And um, hacking really simple, you know, again, your, your junk drawer camera, hacking that camera um, to, to reimagine um, its consumer life and to create a new type of data collection device. So taking a filter out, putting a filter back in, and creating a camera that can uh, view the near infrared. Um, and in these particular images, being able to look at invasive species in a body of water. All right, so um, I really, I think the technology um, is, it's here, it's going to continue to be here. Um, we, to some extent, have to keep up with it. Um, it can leverage, it can support, it can influence the work that we're doing. Um, but it also uh, needs to be understood um, in the sense of uh, a, unraveling tech utopia. So I think that there are, are things that we should be cautious about um, as we build technology into our projects. Um, this is an example of uh, 1970s and 80s. Um, anybody remember the Homebrew Computer Club? Yeah, all right. Um, which I think is a really fantastic example of how collective building uh, a DIY ethos um, can create a revolution in uh, personal computing. So this gave rise to home computers and also many of the, uh, the intellects behind Apple computers. Um, and I use it as an example to think about um, what if in each of our homes um, and our places of work, uh, environmental monitoring tools were as ubiquitous um, as our personal computing devices as, um, as fi I, would, I would say fire alarms, but I don't think enough of us have them in our houses to equate that. Um, but you get the point. Um, so 
I also think that the, the internet um, is incredibly powerful for the scientific field. Um, we can all now be scientists. I'm, I'm not a trained scientist, um, but I've become a community scientist uh, because of the internet, because I can learn, I can share results, I can use science to become active in the decisions that are being made about my community. Um, I can become a stakeholder at the table. I can build networks and I can create with other people. So in the, the rapid era that we're in of, of data accumulation, of information sharing, um, of tech creation, um, I would like us to, to be cautioned, though, about uh, what the cool new technology is hiding. Um, I get hundreds of emails that say, hey, Shannon, did you see this new thing that's coming out? Uh, can't wait. You know, this is going to replace X, Y, and Z. Um, but I think we're also in a, in a time of um, kind of gizmo craze, um, where we're just excited about what the, the next thing coming out is. Um, and we're, we're creating more and more technology without understanding the deeper human context in which it lives. Um, and so I think we really need to get back to that um, and, and centering the human. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, and centering the human at the, the um, center or at the beginning of that conversation um, so that technology lives and dies in, um, in a context in which we understand. So this is what we're trying to do at Public Lab is uh, to, to recontextualize the way that we create together, um, to go to the places, to meet people in their spaces, um, and to work together hand in hand uh, because the, the people that technology is being created for are also the ones that are going to be most influenced by the data that's being collected about them. So we have to be incredibly careful um, to make sure that it's done in a fair and respectful manner. Um, we're also um, entering into what I, I call the era of the generalist. Um, and for all the scientists in the room, um, I love you and you are so um, worthwhile. Um, it's great to have people who are specialists. Um, but I think one of the powerful things um, that we try to advocate for is also that there can be a room for, um, for general scientific knowledge. Um, so using the internet, uh, using the, the time and space when you get together in a, a hackathon type setting um, to, to create, um, to learn about the expertises of other um, can turn us all into scientific generalists. Um, and this harkens back to, uh, I, was, I um, got really obsessed with uh, Benjamin Franklin and his kite experiment uh, a, a year ago, um, which is kind of like disputed at this point. Um, but Ben Franklin is, uh, he was a, a perfect example of what came before the intense professionalization of science. Um, he was uh, an amateur at everything. I mean, he was a policymaker. He was, a, you know, a great thinker. He was a scientist. He was a maker. He was the one who watched somebody get electrocuted by um, uh, a rod, you know, in a lightning storm, and then said, "Well, I'm going to go fly a kite and have a key on it and see if I can replicate and do that experiment better." Um, so I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating for people to go out and try that. Um, I think it's actually legal in some places, but. What I am saying is that we do need to, to really embody and get back to that um, interest in experimentation um, and learning across different sectors. Um, thanks. So we at Public Lab, we advocate um, for the appropriate and responsible use of technology. Um, and so I have only a couple minutes left, and I want to leave you with um, several thoughts about um, ways that we together um, can, can help to navigate um, the, the current um, just crazy influx of technology um, that we're in uh, and hopefully encourage the people that are creating and making uh, to really think through the decisions um, that are, they're embarking on. Um, so the first is uh, get rid of the gatekeepers. Um, so I think this has been really essential in the work that we're doing. Um, the internet has allowed us um, the capacity to go back to where amateur scientists were. Um, 
when they were creating uh, scientific illustrations, they were writing letters to one another, um, they were keeping you know, just really in-depth journals. Um, our ability to edit wiki pages and, and collaborate on information creation, uh, to write blogs, to share via social media, is giving us the ability to, to take away the gatekeeper um, from the equation. So the gatekeeper being the, the highly professionalized positions. Um, Fight to publicize science. All right. So I've, I mentioned, um, you know, the the intense professionalization of science. Um, so we went into this era where science was taken into a lab and given to people that actually do wear white lab coats. Um, and it's really it's really crucial for us in this era to create time and space um, for us to bring science back out into the public um, because science um, shouldn't just be public, it belongs to the public. We have a right to the information that is being produced um, in, this, in this context um, and uh, by companies, by our government agencies, um, and by other communities. Um, so I just was at this really great gathering and was sitting in a group of people who are working in civic technology, and we had a conversation about creating at the pace of inclusion, which I thought was just such a, a wonderful term. Because um, in the, the work that we do, technology, community organizing, and then the environmental issues we're working on all move at vastly different paces. And then you add funders on top of it who want you to get stuff done, and you are in a very complex place. Um, so my, my uh, goal with Public Lab and my suggestion to others is really to, to slow down um, and make sure that you are working and working towards building an inclusive environment where everybody um, can participate and have a chance to understand um, the processes you're using. Um, I also have a, a picture of two women behind their computers. Um, I think it's important for us to think about bringing in the tech people, the designers, not just as consultants or contractors um, on the projects that we're working on, but truly trying to integrate people into the more complex problems that we're all uh, dealing with in you know, the environment and social spaces, um, and to think about building long-term relationships, um, because this is going to be so much more valuable for all of us in the long term, um, instead of just you know, one-day hackathons uh, where you're creating, again, a piece of technology that has no human contextualization to it. Um, the other thing I was really impressed with at this conference was uh, we, we used a space of radical hospitality. Um, has anybody heard that term? Like it? Yeah. Um, so it comes from the Benedictine monks, um, which is really interesting. Um, but one of the, the things that we had hanging on the wall the whole time was a sign that said, open, open, open. Um, and it was in reference to us, like the open people. Uh, but I think it's so powerful when we talk about open source as well. Um, to strip the black box away um, from anything we're creating. For us, it's hardware and software. For you, it might be um, your new web interface for an app that you're developing. Um, and really think about promoting the sharing economy so that people can build and can learn from the work that you've already done. Um, and then depth of experience. So the, the other thing that we get caught up in with technology is just like um, thinking about people as a user, um, thinking about them as an end result for how our platforms, our apps are going to be used. Uh, so this is a picture of our uh, aerial mapping kit. So it's all the pieces. Um, we build um, video tutorials, hand-drawn illustrations to go along with these, um, and really think about how deeply to connect people back to a community, um, rather than uh, just handing them the box and sending them on their way. All right, so I'm gonna leave you, uh, 20 seconds, I think I did good. Uh, I'm gonna leave you, I found this quote a couple of weeks ago um, from Buckminster Fuller, who I, I think many of us in here really like. Um, and he said, this was one of his personal mottos, dare to be naive. Um, and the way that I think about this is uh, dare to be a lot of things. Dare to fail, dare to fail again, dare to fail again, and then pick yourself up and do it right. Um, dare to experiment, dare to be the first person in the room to say, I have no clue what you're talking about, um, to say that 
you're not an expert, um, to, to really encourage uh, new ex uh, experiences and expertises to arise from the room. Um, and then to, to be able to collectively work together um, uh, towards better solutions. Um, so thanks so much. It's an um, honor to be here, and I hope that everybody enjoys the rest of their day.